My name is Ishvan Hatmani. I'm the secretary of the geomathematical and informatics section of the Hungarian Geological Society and one of the co-organizers of this conference. I want to welcome you. Uh, I'd like to share with you the program of this evening. Uh, we're going to hear an opening lecture by Ferenc Fedor, the head of the geomathematical and informatics section of the Hungarian Geological Society, uh, the other co-head organizer of this conference. After that, we're going to hear two plenary lectures, one, one given by Stefan Moizsic from the Earthwish Laurent Research Network, specifically the Research Center for Astronomy and Earth Sciences, formerly affiliated with the University of Colorado. And after that, Chingua Ding from the University of California, Santa Barbara campus, will give us a plenary lecture. Without further ado, Ferenc, the podium is yours. So, you are very lucky, I, I lost my 25 pages speech, so I have only one here. I think you are tired enough, no? So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, it's a great honor for me to welcome to you to Geomates 25 conference, which is also the 22nd uh, Hungarian Geomatical Congress. It's a great, great pleasure to meet you in person, and I look forward to discussing, debating, and enjoying uh, the excellent presentation to come. The last three years have been very difficult with the loss of colleagues, uh, colleagues, loss of sense of reality, and loss of values. We have had to learn to build a new world. It has happened before in history, and I think it will be happening again. Unfortunately, we are facing ever greater challenges, so I do not envy the next generation. I could try to lecture you about geomathematics, uh, its role, its past, present and future, the main topic of the conference, um, but you, uh, the participants, will be lecturing each other at a much higher level than I could ever do in a few minutes of time. I would therefore like to draw your attention to something else. As always, uh, I'm addressing my remarks uh, primarily to the young researchers because the older ones know very well what I am talking about as they have lived it. Dear young colleagues, life is still ahead of you. You are the future and our hopes. You give us faith that there are still young people who choose a career in science who use their brains instead of their emotions, who can stop the madness around us. We need you. Learn, be wiser than your uh, predecessor, uh, predecessors, and pass on your knowledge to those who come after you, to the children, in the way they would expect, and in the way we cannot longer pass on. Maintain your independence because science must remain independent and objective to serve the future and not to the interest of the ones in power. Be open, enjoy your work because uh, only then will you be able to enjoy life. It's hard to ignore it, but ignore the current society which has lost its values where egoism is a daily routine and stupidity is rampant. Remember, you can transfer, uh, cannot transfer power and money to the afterlife. You are more than that because, uh, because you have a purpose. You are students and practitioners of, the, of a wonderful interdisciplinary profession, earth sciences. You are needed because only you can change your world for the better. And those who understand geology, understand mathematics, and can combine the two to provide information for the future will always be needed. 
because few people have the ability to see into the future. Today, three short courses given by professors Madelzi, Geiger, and Sabo have ended. Thank you very much for those. My speech will be followed by two plenary talks by Professor Moisic and Ding. Tomorrow, we will listen to more than 50 exciting presentations. Finally, on Saturday, the program will conclude with a fascinating laboratory visit to the Geochem and Rock Study Laboratories. I wish all of you a very pleasant conference and faithful discussions. I think it's a time to wrap up my, uh, up my speech because everyone is looking forward to the plenary talks. So there is nothing left to do but to officially open the conference. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Moisish, and I am a professor emeritus from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And I am now at the uh, Center for the Study of Earth and Astronomy as part of the Erdfisch Lorand Research Network. I want to begin by thanking uh, President Fodor uh, for his opening remarks, and of course, Secretary Hatvani for his opening remarks, and to them and to the organizers of this meeting. And I want to mention, this was a, an inspiring uh, suite of opening words, but um, anyone over 50 admires young people and certainly envies them because there's uh, an unlimited future uh, before you. So uh, with that, I want to begin my plenary talk by saying something a little bit familiar, but also naturally different. The familiar part is that mathematics is the language of science, and it's not something that just applies here on Earth, but extends anywhere you look in the cosmos. Indeed, if anyone says, well, wouldn't it be fun to go into space? Remind them that you're in space already. <laughs> it's all around you. In fact, you're part of it. If you want to travel to where you can't breathe and you need a, a spacecraft to get there, the distance from us to the realm of outer space is closer to you right now than Budapest is to you. It's only that way. So when I talk about mathematics, I'm talking about it here in this presentation from a geoastronomical point of view in a new science called geoastronomy. So to that end, I'm going to tell you about applying geomathematical principles to planets like the Earth and to the discovery of planets around other stars. So impact bombardments, that's when material falls to planets like the Earth, have significantly heated the crusts of the planets in their early history. You don't see evidence for this on the Earth, but by just looking at the moon, you see the scars that form the face of the man in the moon, or the rabbit in the moon, or whatever it else that you see on the surface of the moon. Interestingly, some of these impacts, very early in the history of the planets, uh, were so intense that they could have sterilized the surface. Now, I asked the question, could I use techniques to understand this propensity for heat being delivered to planets and extend it to our inventory of extrasolar planets? So I'm going to tell you about that today. It's a departure from the normal uh, talk that you might see at a geomathematical congress, but I hope it's familiar to you. This is a map of local space. This is from the ESA Gaia survey of 200 billion stars that comprise our Milky Way galaxy. What you see here is the Milky Way. Oh, this doesn't work. 
What you see here is the Milky Way. This is the plane of our galaxy, populated by 200 billion stars. This dark material here is dust that is between our eyes and the center of the galaxy. These are satellite galaxies called the Magellanic Clouds. There are as many galaxies like this as there are stars in this galaxy. And the fun thing about it, of course, is that each of those stars has planets around it, which in their early histories were bombarded, were very intensely struck by the leftovers of the planet formation process. This diagram is age on this axis in millions of years. So these are stars that just formed. This axis here is a ratio of uh, overproduction of infrared all that means is that the more you go this way, the more dust is around the star, absorbing heat and transmitting it in the infrared to be picked up by telescopes. The higher you are here, the more dust. How do you make dust? Take rocks and smash them together to make little rocks and little rocks and little rocks. There's a lot of dust production here, but things settle down as the system dynamically cools, right? Because you're, you stop grinding things, but occasionally something pops up here above this E-folding line. This is a normal E-folding progression, E to the minus some, some function times T. These are evidences of planets smashing into one another. Well, that's interesting because in other observations, again, by ground and space-based telescopes, we see dust production shown here. This is a lot of dust, not so much. This is sort of background here. And age, this is 100 million years. And then dust is declining with time. It's like having somebody come and clean your living room, right, with the vacuum cleaners, vacuuming up the dust. What is vacuuming up the dust are planets. Our Earth is currently vacuuming up dust and rocks at 20,000 tons per year. Sounds like a lot, 20,000 tons. It's infinitesimally small compared to the mass of the Earth. So if you go back in time to the earliest days of our planet, that intensity of rain of material should have been greater. I showed you the Gaia image of our Milky Way galaxy with 200 billion stars. We've mapped 1% of the galaxy with its stars. In the past 25 years, we have found over 5,000 planets around stars. And these are the easiest planets. Now, this is the discovery year. Uh, we're over here, of course. This is from a paper that's coming out next month. And these are the planets here in terms of mass. Here's the Earth's mass here, shown here. This is the mass of Jupiter up here, the largest planet of our solar system, more than all the other planets combined in mass, and each of these different bubbles here represents an extrasolar planet around another star. And it follows a Moore's Law type progression. As you see in computing power, so you see it in the rate of discovery of extrasolar planets. This is about to explode with James Webb Space Telescope, with the Plato mission, with the Ariel mission, in fact, they, the newspapers might run out of ink describing the next great weird discovery of something around another star. I emphasize this for you because when you go out at night in a dark sky, away from Beige, away from Budapest, away from so forth, and you look up, every star you see has planets around it. Every single one. The human eye can detect about 2,000 stars easily. Mine, a bit fewer. 
So I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes about impact bombardments, how they're a natural part of the planet formation process. Such bombardment, so bombardments dictate the physical and chemical states of planets. Impact heating leads to local, regional, and extreme cases, wholesale global sterilization. It turns out, and this is heartwarming, it's very difficult to sterilize a planet. It's almost impossible because life soaks almost every rock on Earth, everywhere you go. Finally, we generalize the effects of late accretion to planets of different masses. The way we do this is we take an initial temperature distribution. You take the crust, as geophysics uh, tells us, as a particular uh, thermal conductivity profile. It acts like a thermal boundary layer, and it has known properties, known equations of state. We use the Mernigan equation of state from Kiefer and Simons. There are others, but this is an analytical treatment. This is not a treatment that uses, for instance, smooth particle hydrodynamics. None of that. And the reason for that is I can put this analytical treatment here where P is the peak shock pressure that's delivered, which is something that we get from the uh, mv squared relationship, from the kinetic energy relationship. It's quite simple. We know the mass is coming in. We know their velocity distributions. We can calculate this. K naught is the adiabatic bulk modulus at zero pressure, because at the surface, you can treat the there's no atmosphere, and you can treat these rocks at constant state. Finally, N is the pressure derivative of this bulk modulus, and V naught is the specific uncompressed target volume that we have. And we're going to compress this target volume with a shock pressure, but that shock pressure drops off with distance R here according to a power law. Because you, you are striking a surface, you're causing an explosion to occur, and the energy very quickly dissipates around it. This has been verified by, of all things, nuclear bomb tests. Much of this science was created after the nuclear test bomb, bomb test treaty prohibited any kind of weapons testing at the surface. Uh, Pizarro and Malash in 2000 also showed that uh, the decay of the exponent and the pressure relationship varies with impact velocity. All of this is done analytically because we are dealing with millions of impacts. So I can use a gaming computer. So those people who sit in their parents' basements and buy up all of the graphic processing cards to do Bitcoin mining or play games or both, they are excellent for my science because they are driving the technology to more efficient, more powerful computing power. So what we can do here then is I can use a gaming computer, right? And I can have a system where this is in meters here in the y-axis and here meters in the x-axis with a two kilometer projectile impacting at 20 kilometers per second, which is about uh, 14 times faster than a bullet. Now, I can let this system relax thermally with time, and I do this by convection and conduction with the addition of water in the crust. So, of course, many of you know this already, geothermal temperature, uh, profiles can be created knowing uh, the thermal conductivity of the system. And I can cross-check with hydrocode simulations. Hydrocode simulations use a, a very high-quality, intensive mesh algorithm where you have tens of thousands of particles, each of which you're following the equation of state of. Well, we can compare our output with that of hydrocode simulations, which 
require a supercomputer to run one impact. Well, when we do that, we find that the agreement is about within about 10%. So with my gaming computer, I can run millions of impacts, whereas with a supercomputer, just one, and it takes about four weeks. Now I'm going to model extrasolar planets. All of the work I showed you has been published for the last 14 years. This is new. None of this is published yet. So what I'm going to say is, look, I'm interested in looking at planets that we've already found. For instance, a mini Earth, something about the size of Mars, has a 16.8 kilometer per second impact velocity. How about a super Earth, like one that's found around our nearest stellar neighbor, Proxima Centauri? It is twice Earth's mass. Well, I get all kinds of differences in the impact velocity because larger mass, greater impact velocity. Mass delivered, here's the matrix for that, for mini Earths, for Earth, for a twice Earth mass, for 10 times Earth mass. I can use exponential decline from a paper we published five years ago with my colleague Ramon Brasser, who's also at CSFK. Bombardment duration for a billion years. Source is from the asteroid belt because we don't know if there are asteroid belts around other stars, so we have to use ours. Impact angle, the average between zero and 90 is 45, the last time I checked. Target density is 2.7 uh, grams per cubic centimeter, and then I can use different equilibrium geothermal gradients at 20 or 70 C per kilometer. This shows you that there, there is an enormous range of parameter space that we can investigate. But let's try just these two. This is a simulation using a mini Earth, something about the mass of Mars, which you have control of back there. If you could move the cursor over to here and click the play button, that would be just lovely. And if it doesn't work, we will move on. <laughs> it doesn't work. All right. I'm going to show you the output data. But what, I, what we did here is I made a 150 kilometer deep cuboid here with the entire surface. Oh, look. It's a miracle. <laughs> All I have to do is wave my hand. But you can see that the show is over quickly, right? It's a small planet. Maybe we could do that again. I know, I'll wave my hand again. <laughs> Wrong direction. And then I'll, I'll go this way. That's it. Did you see? There were lots of bombardments here, and that's time at the top, but then it runs out. If I go to the next slide, this is something twice the mass of the Earth. This should be a little bit more exciting. More mass, more gravity. More gravity, more velocity. More velocity, more kinetic energy. Look at that. There's a lot. And then it cools, the system cools down after about a billion years. If I go to the next planet, 10 times Earth's mass. This is cranking it up, all right? So now, if you were living there, it would be a bad day. <laughs> uh, actually, a bad eon. Um, but nevertheless, thank you so much for the technical support. The outcome is common that many Earths, like Mars, look very habitable. There's not a lot of thermal reworking of the surface. Earth, on the other hand, it's in a sweet spot. We're obviously here, so it's OK. Twice Earth's mass, it's starting to look like Chicken Little World, where the sky is falling. And then in 10 times Earth's mass, you might as well forget about it. However, when I look at the data, uh, we wrote a program called POKE which is to take the entire crust 
and put random thermometers in it and monitor the temperature fields with time. Here's time in millions of years. And here are the different test cases. Small Earth, like Mars, just like Earth here, twice Earth's mass and 10 times Earth mass. At any point in time, you never melt everything. And that's the point that I wanted to make. It's very difficult to melt the crust because it takes an enormous amount of energy to do it. Uh, the low temperature heat of vaporization of rock is one and a half million joules per kilogram. It's just tough to do. However, what if you're trying to live there? There are organisms that live at 100 degrees water, no problem. So you boil the water, you think it's safe. There are organisms that only reproduce in boiling water. So what I did was, is I looked at the poke output program, and I said, well, what if I was one of those boiling water-loving organisms, hypothermophiles? Well, my habitable volume in the crust actually increases thanks to the bombardment. So depending on who you are, this might actually be a good thing. Here are my conclusions. I told you that early impact bombardments are a common feature of planets. But I didn't tell you this conclusion. None of the scenarios I investigated were sufficient to fully melt the crust in any of these planets at any given time. Super Earth mode reached about 45% of the crust molten. Intense bombardment may have precluded initial life, but as you go along, nothing stops life from continuing once it is established. They could have sterilized maybe 60% of near surface habitable volume, but um, that leaves a lot left behind. Now, I can't do this kind of work without support of my colleagues in Hungary from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, from the uh, JFK, from the Konkoy Observatory, and from the Utvershlorand Research Network. And also my collaborators in the Geoastronomy Project, which are shown here. And what we're trying to do is build bridges between geo, math, and astronomy. Thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to our discussions together. Thank you very much for this intriguing talk. Um, I think we have, if I may, we have time for one or two questions. I would be delighted. We have time for two questions. If anyone has any questions for Professor Moisish. It was so clear. <laughs> In fact, it was. In fact, it was. There will be a quiz afterwards. Okay. I will make that if it's Yes, please. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a question. Okay. Uh, so I'm Istvan Nemes from uh, MOL. My question would be to the first part of the, your speech. So you told that the Earth is being bombed by approximately 20,000 tons of uh, debris or dust uh, per day. Per year. Per year, sorry. Uh, and how much do we lose? So is Earth gaining way by time or losing way by time? The only way the Earth can lose mass is atmosphere. by atmosphere. The Earth loses very, very little atmosphere. And the reason for that is that Earth has a, has a very interesting atmospheric temperature profile. The farther up you go, the colder it gets. And then it gets very, very, very cold. So you reach a cold trap at the top of the atmosphere. It's only after that that you reach the exosphere where the top of the atmosphere is hot and hydrogen bleeds out by diffusion. In a planet like Venus, however, you don't know. My voice is loud. <laughs> In a planet like Venus, however, the situation is different. Venus has a surface temperature that's very high indeed, about 450 C. 
So its atmosphere is extremely hot. So Venus uh, does not have that cold trap like the Earth does. So it, it loses mass out the top. Not a lot, but it does. And Mars, of course, I mean, it's just bleeding hydrogen like crazy and nitrogen even. So uh, Earth gains mass, but as I mentioned, it's infinitesimally small compared to the total mass of the planet. But if you go back in time, like I showed you in those figures, uh, the, the amount of mass uh, acquired per year increases by a million fold. It's just the system undergoes a dynamic relaxation. Actually, that's the frontier of research now is how quickly is that relaxation time uh, for our solar system. Yes, but you, you know, yeah, the, the way planets, the planets don't grow like rolling a snowball down a hill. What they, what they do is they grow by putting a bunch of big snowballs all together at once early, and then the rest it's sprinkling a little on top since that time. You're welcome. University of Seged, nice and I uh, and I was wondering if if you can build in the velocity increases resulting from the attraction of of larger planets in our solar system, like Jupiter, into your system or into your model. Can I use gravitational focusing? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> so indeed, um, uh, I'll, this will be in the reading assignment yeah. after. <laughs> no, but um, it. it it's interesting because the architecture of the planets has changed. The, in fact, the planets have more or less formed where they are now, if you're Earth, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. But Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, no. In fact, uh, they're so far out that they must have been closer in in order to gain so much mass. And then they migrated. So it's. Do you like billiards? Yes. Do you play pool? Yeah. Good. You look like you might, right? <laughs> right? What do you do with on a pool table? You break. You, it's called breaking, right? You set up the balls and then you you hit them. Jupiter acts like that uh, the cue ball that breaks the whole system because it governs the angular momentum of the system. Ninety-nine percent of the moment arm of the solar system is Jupiter. If you move that, everything else moves. So uh, if that moves just a little bit, then you reach chaotic situations, which is now, uh, it hasn't happened in 4 billion, 480 million years, thankfully, and it won't happen again. But in some places, it's wiped out their inner solar systems. There are solar systems where the Jupiter moved all the way in towards the sun. And if there were any Earths there, they were kicked out. Didn't happen here. Whew! <laughs> Thanks for the questions. And thank you. Thank you for the lecture. As a sign of our gratitude, it's not much. A certificate from the geomathematical and informatics <laughs> section of the Hungarian Geological Society. Thank you very much, Professor Moises. We finally arrived to the closing ceremony. Well, you're lucky you don't see that this is the first slide out of the 32 that I'm going to speak about in the next 35 or 45 minutes. We'll see. No, I'm just joking. So um, thank you all for being here and spending these hours, days with us. Uh, but first of all, Ferenc Fedor, co-organizer of this conference, would like to thank someone special who helped all of us, and all of us should thank her for uh, her efforts and time. So, Barbie, please, come here. Barbara Bonner, that's, let's give her a hand. She was the steam engine. She was the steam engine behind the operative things.
Yeah. She's happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, maybe, I think this is not common in conferences, but, but this is different conferences, we all know. I'd like to thank the Hotel AV Services and Jofi especially for uh, providing this fantastic technical equipment and running it throughout the two days and streaming, streaming the conference. So this couldn't have happened without them, without her. So, so let's, let's, let's give a hand to all the team, the technical staff at the venue as well, the Page Regional Committee, and this is the headquarters of the Page, Page Regional Committee. And uh, I'm going to grab the presenter. Just a few numbers. Of, about the conference. There were 55 participants here, 90 here and five online, which I think it's, it's a great number. It increased by 30% since, since uh, three years ago, pre-COVID, from more than 15 countries across the world. So, so you're great and it was awesome to have you all here. There were three short courses by Professor Manfred Mudelze, Professor Norbert Peter Sabu, and uh, Professor Geiger, and more than 25 different institutes represented themselves at this conference. More than 25 institutes from higher education, research centers, and the industry as well, with, with, with the big oil companies of the region, INA and MOL. So there were 50 hours 50 hours of scientific content. 50 hours of scientific content. Yeah, Barbie's right. <laughs> we should give ourselves a hand. 14 posters and a 91 page abstract book. And this is just the beginning because you know that there are two special issues in the International Journal on Gem Mathematics in Springer and Central European Geology uh, at the Academia Publisher in Hungary. So I think. Everyone likes to see themselves. These are a few highlights that Gabor provided us. He's there with the camera, so we could give him a hand as well. And I'd like to highlight the steering committee of the, of the geomathematical section of the Hungarian Geological Society. Sándor Gulyás, Gabor Szatmári, Daniel Erdei, Ferenc Feder is the head and I was the secretary and I'd like to close with the thoughts of Laurent or in other countries they call him Roland Utwash. The teaching of scientists is as many as the number of science and the number of scientists themselves. One goes into details, the other deals with more general theories. One with words, the other dictates. One does experiments, the other deduces. And here comes the point I think that's true for all of us. It is impossible to tailor all to the same scheme, nor is it allowed because the value of the teaching is given by its individual nature. And all of you, all of your presentations were individual, unique, and I think all of them broaden our perspective on things. And for those who gave uh, keynote speeches, we'd like to honor Honor them with a certificate. Balash Seke, if you could come out, please. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation in meandering. Sándor Gulyás. We're only mentioning those who are still here with us. Laszlo Kovács from Engineering Geology. He's the head of the Kömeru LTD, one of the locations, one of the, the excursion is gonna to go today. Yuzu Jordan, <clears throat> from Balint Analytical Limited. And, may I? Ferenc Fedor. <laughs> okay, and this is the closing thought. See you guys in two years in the next Geomates conference, Geomates 24, which will be the 23rd Hungarian Congress, uh, Congress of Hungarian Geomathematicians. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here with us. And uh, 
Let's continue making science.